It's showtime. <laughs> Stones are certainly a very hard act to follow, but nevertheless, I'll, I'll give it my best shot. This is Dr. Minarsik. Uh, today is Thursday, October 11th. It's 9 o'clock here in Chicago. You know the big topic that we're going to be talking about now for the next few sessions is tumors. And this is Tumors One Day. You may have heard Shazina announce it for you. We're in Chicago. This is session number 11 out of what will probably be around 75 sessions of Global Online Medical School Pathology. Uh, I don't have too much uh, to say today, but the thing we always have to do is the test, and I think I already know how it's going to turn out, but let's do it anyway. First question for your pathology exam is, can you hear me well? Okay, and I'm sure you heard the Rolling Stones too. And of course, the second uh, question now uh, has two parts. Part one is what do you see? 
on your screen. Okay, you all got that right. Nobody says, I can't see anything. But I want to I want to do a, a test of extreme uh, resolution. Uh, I don't know what kind of systems everybody out there has. But uh, do you see my pointer on the big red pepper? Okay, now can I ask you a question? What is the tiny, tiny thing at the very tip of that pointer? It's very tiny. Yeah, it's just a little white spot. That's good. Now, here's the hard question. Do you see the very, very, very tiny three white spots just to the right of it? If you do, then this is just incredible. Oh, my God, you all do. Wow, that means you're going to see every nucleolus and every tumor today, and I'm really happy about that. Okay, well then we're probably ready to go. I, I wanted to tell you, you, you can never really communicate well with people unless you tell them your fears. You know, everybody has fears, and you know, as a student, your fear is failing your exam or looking stupid in front of your peers. Actually, that's the same as my fear. I have a fear that I will, uh, sometimes even nightmares, you know, that I'll, I'll get up and I'll... Uh, try to talk about something and either I don't know about it or uh, I don't have my clothes on. I'm sure you've all had crazy nightmares like that. The nice thing about doing webinars is I could be naked right now and I would have uh, nothing to be afraid of. But actually I'm not because Chicago's getting kind of uh, cool these days so I got on a bunch of nice sweatpants. Um, let's talk about tumors. In fact, you know, we might as well get the first slide open here, too. Oh, I think I opened it already. Oh, and by the way, I got to make sure that I can um, make sure that Dr. Kamath is our uh, organizer. Oh, he's here, so I'm going to make him an organizer. Hold on. I go to the uh, attendee list. I find Girish Kamath. And, you know, I hope today somewhere along the line he has a microphone and he could say a few words. I just made him the uh, organizer right now. And I guess if he has a microphone there, he could probably say something right now. Uh, I don't know. But if not, we'll hear him eventually. He's our silent guru. He's the answer man that answers everything in chat. That's what. A, that's a great job. Uh, let's talk about tumors again. Oh, I don't know how to start. Uh, this is my uh, biggest chapter. This is my favorite chapter. And uh, I wanted to tell you, like, uh, you know, at most medical schools, uh, there's a bunch of pathologists on staff or associated. Some of them are renal pathologists. Some of them are lung pathologists. Some of them are GI or skin pathologists. And they basically get these guys together every year and they say, okay, you're the skin pathologist. You give the three lectures on skin. You know, you're the renal pathologist. You give the uh, three or four lectures on renal. So uh, if you took all 29 chapters of Robbins and you said to all the pathologists in the world or on staff of a big university, you get to take your pick of what you want to talk about. Well, everybody would grab neoplasia because it's a big, 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 big thing of what we do our whole life. Even though neoplasia is only one chapter out of 29, it's about Oh, I would say 60, 70, maybe 80% of what pathologists do every day. So every pathologist considers himself a big, big, big expert on cancer. They find cancer. They talk about cancer. They explain cancer. They do tests for cancer. Uh, they read about it. They go up uh, at tumor boards and conferences. They even talk to families about cancer. So we all consider so ourselves to be big experts. So the... Um, the goal of this uh, next couple of sessions, we'll probably have two or three sessions, and then we'll have a big lab, maybe a full day lab at the end of it. So I think we'll probably have about three sessions this year. Uh, the first two will be PowerPoints, and maybe the third day might be entirely lab. But uh, it's a really, really, really big topic, and it's an interesting topic. Now, here, here's our title page, okay, neoplasia. You know, neoplasia is pretty much the same thing as neoplasms, you know, 
It's probably the plural of neoplasm in Latin or something like that. Uh, I guess it's also synonymous with the word tumors. Okay, and even though we told you originally that tumor was any swelling like a bump on the head, uh, if you subtract the bumps on the heads or the swellings that are not due to neoplasms, you uh, now have a good definition or a synonym for the word neoplasm. Neo all, neoplasms, tumors, they're all the same word. Now, when I prepare these PowerPoints, uh, I often go to Google and I uh, try to find the best, most sharp image. So like I know, for example, if you saw those three dots on the tomato, you can see the exact contour of this nucleus here. It might look a little bit like Africa or New Jersey. You could see various bumps within bumps within bumps. You could probably see these tiny, tiny dots here. And that's the purpose. So the very highest quality uh, images for tumors uh, could not be attained through Googling, but they're attained through the University of Iowa. It's about time I give Iowa credit because all of our cases in Rock Lab, all of our laboratory slides are taken from the Iowa histopathology. Now you could go to their website and just look at them and they're really, really, really good. But I can't look at them with you on the website because that takes up bandwidth and that would totally destroy our webinar. It would interfere with a, a bandwidth of our webinar. So if you want really, really, really good pictures, uh, you should probably uh, ask them for their actual slides and view them offline and then just snap a picture of them using various methods. And for those of you who have already started Rock Lab, and I know some of you have, you know that a lot of the questions will be asking you to snap pictures. For example, if I showed you in Rock Lab a, a picture of a uh, a breast cancer, which by the way this is, okay, and I would say uh, take a picture of uh, a cell with a prominent nucleolus. You know, you might you might zip down here to this cell here or to this cell here or this cell here. So uh, I want to give credit to uh, University of Iowa today as well and um, getting back to my fear, the fear that I had today is when I woke up even though I had a great sleep, I was not really fully awake. Sometimes it takes a long time to get up. And my fear is that I wouldn't be alert by the time the webinar started. So I ran downstairs and I gulped down a, a big cup of coffee and now I feel like I am qualified. So let's uh, quit making the introductory statements and talk about <clears throat> what we're gonna talk about. Uh, as you know, neoplasia is overwhelmingly the biggest section in Rock Lab, and it is a very, very big chapter in Robbins, and it's basically what pathologists do. Okay, and also, if you remember, it's one third of all pathology, even though it's only one of 29 chapters. When we originally divided pathology into inflammations, degenerations, and neoplasia, Neoplasia was the biggest. And if you notice, uh, if you've read some of the chapters in Robbins or other textbooks, you'll notice that whenever they discuss a certain system, like lung, for example, maybe first they'll talk about the degenerations and then they'll talk about the inflammations. And at the end, they always talk about the tumors, the benign tumors, the malignant tumors. So in every uh, systemic pathology uh, chapter that we go through, neoplasm will probably be the finale, the the uh, culmination, the end of the uh, discussion. And our discussion today is that we're going to start to make some basic definitions, some terms you may have heard, but we got to get them really nailed down and clarified because uh, many people, you know, even experienced, uh, you know, surgeons and even some pathologists use them incorrectly. We're going to talk about nomenclature of tumors, general about, about the biology of tumor growth, we're going to talk about the epidemiology of cancer. And then we're going to talk about probably the number one question for people expecting to uh, learn about tumors is what causes it. So we're going to talk about epidemiology, which is a part of cause, risk factors. We're going to talk about the molecular basis of cancer. And we're going to talk about the molecular basis of the causes for cancer. 
Then we talk about the things that we all heard, like you know, cigarette smoking and you know, uh, aniline dyes, certain chemicals. We talk about the usual suspects. And if you remember, we've talked about the usual suspects two or three times before. And it seems like the usual suspects cause everything in pathology. And they all boil down to uh, physical agents like radiation, certain specific chemicals, and also pathogens. So those three guys are always the uh, usual suspects. Then we we'll talk about what your body does to fight cancer. And then we're going to go into a lot of clinical features and things like perineoplastic syndromes. And that's what we'll be talking about for the next uh, probably three days. I was debating whether we should do a little lab at the end of every session or whether we should really dive into it uh, for about two days and then do maybe uh, we could do this chapter in two days possibly or four hours then maybe at the end uh, we could take a whole day or even more if necessary to do a lot of cases in the lab uh, and I decided we're going to do at least one entire day of nothing but lab because that's fun so the the chapter itself is not bad there's a little bit of shoveling uh, not too much uh, it's pretty logical um, and then at the end, you're going to be rewarded for your intense uh, attention and hard work by just kicking around in the lab for at least an entire day. Okay, so let's define the word that's the title of the chapter. What's the definition of a neoplasia? Well, we all know a neoplasia tumor, okay? Uh, there's a guy named Willis. I wish I knew more about him. I should have looked it up. I'm sure he's a famous guy. Maybe he won some Nobel Prize. I don't know. But this is the best definition that even, I, I couldn't have thought of a better definition than Willis. And let's read it. A neoplasm is an abnormal mass of tissue. You know, that means cells. The growth of which exceeds and is uncoordinated with that of normal tissues. In other words, it's lost its growth control. And this growth persists in the excessive, in the same excessive manner, even after the end or the cessation of whatever caused it. That's the great definition of neoplasia. And remember, from that definition, we are talking about both benign as well as malignant tumors. So don't ever equate neoplasm itself with malignancy, okay? Because if you remember when we defined tumors originally on day one, we said the two kinds are benign and malignant. Okay, so all of these changes are genetic changes. Now, what does autonomous mean? It means that the growth of the tumor is independent of the usual growth control genes. And finally, whenever that cell appears, which we call cancer, okay it's probably got to be somewhere in an individual cell and that's the cell that proliferates after it proliferates it could differentiate it could become necrotic it could die it could multiply it could metastasize it could invade but it's clonal it starts out as one individual cell okay now sit back and I want to tell you something I'm going to go over this again and maybe a lot of you already know it. But here's the one thing you have to keep in your mind, especially because about a third of this whole presentation will be talking about the causes of cancer. You know, when I was a kid, and you know, maybe you're a kid right now, I don't know. I always thought that cancer was caused by some little genetic change in a cell which makes it go wild. In other words, it's, it's like the Jekyll and Hyde theory again. you got a normal cell, and then something happens in that cell. It would have to happen at the DNA level. And it then makes that cell go into a malignant, infiltrative, crazy, wild, nasty, bad cell. <clears throat> well, that's wrong. It's all wrong. Uh, these theories may have been entertained a couple of generations ago, but what has become clear now is that cancer is not caused because genetic changes cause that cell to be wild. Cancer is caused 
by a wide variety in genetic changes of growth control mechanisms. In other words, it's not because, you know, the uh, Dr. Jekyll did not turn into Mr. Hyde because he drank some potion and it made him crazy. Dr. Jekyll turned into Mr. Hyde because the usual factors which keep him under control, those genetic factors, have mutated. Okay, keep that in mind. And, you know, if I have to say it again, I will. And I probably will say it again because that's like the main theory now. Uh, and it will stay that way because it's the truth behind all uh, uh, tumors. Okay. Let's talk about general nomenclature of tumors. As you know, when you read a pathology report and it's a tumor, somewhere along the line, most likely you're going to see the word OMA. Okay? Now, if the word is carcinoma or sarcoma or lymphoma or melanoma or hepatoma, it's going to be a malignant tumor. But if you don't see those things before OMA, if you just see the word OMA itself after a certain type of tissue, for example, in plain old OMA of cartilage is a chondroma. That's benign. A plain old OMA of fibroblasts is a fibroma. That's benign. A plain old OMA of osteo or bone is osteoma. Now, of course, if you put the word sarc in here, like chondrosarcoma, or fibrosarcoma, or osteosarcoma, then those are the malignant counterparts. But if you don't see sarc, or carcino, or adenocarcino, omas generally mean benign. Now, another thing to remember is that cancer is not the same as carcinoma. Carcinomas are cancers of epithelial-derived tissues. The cancers of non-epithelial, or if you want to use the word stromal, or if you want to use the word mesenchymal, or if you want to use the word mesodermally derived structures, those are sarcomas. And they're two different animals, but they're both cancers. So let's talk about the carcinomas now, or the epithelial tumors that are benign and malignant. If you remember, Epithelial structures generally arise from either ectoderm on the outside of your body or endoderm on the inside of your body, like the GI tract. That's a broad, broad, broad generality. And, you know, the stuff between embryologically and anatomically is your connective tissue. So, a benign tumor of a gland or a benign tumor of glandular tissue or a benign tumor of an organ that is a gland, like a pancreas, for example, is an adenoma. A benign tumor of any type, which grows like uh, finger-like projections, is called a papilloma. A benign tumor of a cystic gland yeah, ovary is the most notorious example, but technically it's anywhere. It could be pancreas. Is a papillary cyst adenoma. Okay, so those are the benign epithelial tumors. Adenomas, papillomas. Adenomas are usually glandular. Papillar, papillomas can be glandular or squamous. And papillary cyst adenomas are glandular, but they also form cysts. Now remember, this is generic nomenclature. We're not talking about any specific classification yet. Now, we have to now introduce the benign tumor, the concept of a polyp. You hear people have polyps of their colon. You hear people have polyps of their uh, upper respiratory tract, their sinuses. Okay. Technically speaking, usually a polyp is not a true neoplasm. Usually a polyp is a uh, blebbing or a projection above a mucosal surface. Let's say, for example, in a nasal polyp, you've heard of those, it would just be basically edema of the uh, connective tissue that supports the epithelium. 
to the point where it looks like an actual tumor. That's called a polyp. Now, that's not 100% true because in the GI uh, tract, for example, you can have polyps that are totally benign and not truly neoplastic even, but you can also have polyps that are truly neoplastic. But no matter what you can think of when you hear the word polyp, it should always be benign. Whether it's a true neoplasm or not doesn't really matter. So let's just look at some a few pictures now. Because uh, in the course of this course, we're going to be looking at a lot of tumors. <clears throat> and let's say you didn't know this was a tumor, but you would say, you know, if I was walking through the forest and uh, I had to go through something like this, it looks like that there's a lot of these long finger-like projections. You see, here's a finger-like projection. Here is, here is, here is, here is, here is, here is. For the most part, this tumor is composed of finger-like projections. When you see the finger-like pattern of growth, it's papillary, and this is a tumor. And it doesn't matter whether this tumor is benign or malignant, it's papillary, okay? Now, a papillary structure is a finger-like projection of tumor, and it has a little blood vessel and connective tissue on the inside, and it has epithelium on the outside. It could be either benign or malignant. This is just an adjective applied to tumors. Now, if this was a squamous epithelium, you call it a squamous papilloma, or maybe a papillary squamous carcinoma. If it's glandular epithelium, which it is, by the way, you could tell these are columnar cells here, a single layer of columnar cells, you could then call it a papillary adenoma. Now, even though we said that, once again, this was a tumor of the colon, don't think of colon, just think of the general principle, because I'll tell you, most people, a lot of medical students, and even myself, we really, it didn't, never had a clear idea of what papillary meant. Well, it could be either benign or malignant, but so has a pattern of growth that's finger-like and has epithelium on the outside and connective tissue on the inside. So, when you hear the word papillary, and you'll hear it about 50 more times in this course, maybe 100, think of a finger. This is a colon and it's opened up. So there's a little bit of the fat and connective tissue on the outside. There are some mucosal folds. You know, if, if it was a small bowel, uh, it, the, you'd call it a certain type of mucosal fold. If it was a colon, you'd call it maybe uh, a haustrum, okay? But nevertheless, you're looking at the uh, opened luminal or mucosal aspect. And you can see, it looks like there's something that bulges above it. And this is what you might call a colon polyp. Now, certain colon polyps are not true neoplasms. That's why they're called hyperplastic polyps. And certain colon polyps are true clonal neoplasms. And those are called adenomatous polyps. And I'm gonna pop open the window right now and ask you a question. If I told you that the two types of colon polyps, hyperplastic and adenomatous are the two types, and only one of them had a possibility of turning into cancer, which one do you think it would be? You think it would be the adenomatous or the hyperplastic? Absolutely. Well, most of you are saying adenomatous. There's a few hyperplastics, but at least you learn something. I love wrong answers. I do them all the time myself. Now, here's a microscopic view of that same thing. In this particular case, remember, we're not talking about colon. Thing. We're talking about the concept of a polyp. If you look at the cells comprising this polyp, they generally look quite similar to the cells of the mucosa from which it arisen. You see, here's normal colon mucosa. It's coming up as a stalk. The stalk has connective tissue. You can see blood vessels. The stalk might be continuous with the submucosa of the colon, but it also forms the basis or the stalk on which this polyp rests. Now, we don't have to worry right now whether this is adenomatous, hyperplastic, benign, or malignant. 
but we do have to understand the concept of a polyp. Okay. Uh, is there anything else I want to say? Oh yes, there is something very important to say. If this polyp protruded from the normal mucosa by a distinct stalk, it's called pedunculated, meaning pedestal. If it protruded flat and there was no stalk, you would call it non-pedunculated. And by the way, if you looked at this polyp, whether it's pedunculated or not, and rather than having these rather circular patterns of growth, if it looked predominantly like it was finger-like projections, like you see some here, then you would call it a papillary tumor. And if you look closely at some of these papillary structures and you found malignant cells, you call it papillary adenocarcinoma. And if you look at some of these papillary structures, by the way, this is not predominantly papillary, but I did find a few areas for you. If you look at a couple of these structures and they were um, all benign, then you call it a papillary adenoma. Or in the case of a colon, papillary benign adenomas are also called villus, V-I-L-L-O-U-S adenomas. And if I told you that there was a small chance of an adenomatous polyp turning into cancer, let me ask you this, just offhand. What do you think is the chance of a benign-looking villus or papillary adenoma turning into cancer? Yeah, somebody said 75. That's pretty high. Uh, that's about right. Uh, you know what? If you talk to some of the old surgeons and some of the people who really know, with time, they say approximately 100%. But 75 is probably a very good answer. Okay, let's get into some text again. Let's talk about the nomenclature of malignant tumors now. Malignant tumors derived from connective tissue. Remember from histology or connective tissue, bone, cartilage, you know, those are uh, malignant tumors of connective tissue or mesodermally derived tissues are called sarcomas. Malignant tumors of epithelial structures are called carcinomas. It's as simple as that. It's even easier than the benign one. So a malignant tumor of cartilage is a chondrosarcoma. Remember, the benign one was just a regular old chondroma. The malignant tumors of fibrous tissue are fibrosarcomas. Remember the benign one was just fibroma? Malignant tumors of bone are called osteosarcomas. Remember the benign ones were just old osteomas? Now, even though we put sarcomas first, the mesenchymal or the mesodermally derived uh, tissues, we're putting carcinoma second. Let me ask you this. Of all the malignancies uh, known to man commonly. What percentage of them do you think are carcinomas rather than sarcomas? Just as a rough guess. Ah, yeah, most of them are carcinomas. Most malignancies are epithelial malignancies rather than mesenchymal malignancies. I would say probably five to one or something like that, or most of them. That's the correct answer. Now, if your epithelium is glandular, adeno means gland, then it's called an adenocarcinoma. If your epithelium, you remember glandular epithelium is usually single columnar or single cuboidal. Well, malignancies of non-stratified columnar or cuboidal is adenocarcinoma. What about malignancies of squamous? Okay, stratified squamous epithelium, you know, like skin or esophagus or that's called squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, let me ask you this. Let's say that you had a malignancy of the transitional 
epithelium lining the lower GI tract. What do you think you would call that? Well, they're called TCCs, or transitional cell carcinomas. And somebody actually got the better answer. I could see uh, Ricardo said urothelial, and that's even more correct, because most of the things they call transitional, and still do, they generally now to call those urothelial, okay? Now, let's say that you see a cancer, you, it, 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 it looks like it's epithelial, you know, there's, it doesn't look like connective tissue, um, but it's not really forming glands, and you can't really see features of squamous, you might call that an undifferentiated carcinoma. Now, there's a whole gazillion battery of tests you could do to show that maybe it was ultimately glandular or squamous, but, you know, from the basic morphological point of view, carcinomas or epithelial malignancies, which do not form recognizable glands or squamous structures, are just called undifferentiated. Now, can I ask you a question? If you see a tumor that's really undifferentiated completely, you might think, well, you know, maybe it's not even a carcinoma. Maybe it's a sarcoma. So once again, that's our principle of if it looks really, really, really primitive, uh, and you can't tell where it comes from, it'll be easy to diagnose in terms of malignancy, but it'll be hard to exactly figure out where it came from. In this case, we don't even know if it came from uh, epithelial tissue or connective tissue. Now here, I got to make a little bit of a, a, a misclaimer here or disclaimer. I told you that mesoderm gives rise to sarcomas and the other two give rise to carcinomas. But remember, when you look at ectoderm and uh, endoderm as well, there's connective tissue elements. So you could have technically uh, um, connective tissue tumors that are part of uh, ectoderm and uh, endoderm. And similarly, even mesoderm can give rise to carcinoma as well. Because remember, uh, undifferentiated primitive cells, or what they call pluripotential or totipotential or multipotential cells, can differentiate in just about to any direction. There's a couple of guys that just won a Nobel Prize uh, that have blown my mind because they uh, have changed the way I'm thinking now about the concept of differentiation. Okay, let's give you an easy one here. You know already from your experience that this is a squamous mucosa here up on the upper right. And you can even see perhaps some even uh, keratinized uh, layers. You don't know if this is skin or not. You might want to call it skin, but you don't really see any skin appendages. Uh, but it might be skin. And you can see you have your normal maturation from your stratum germinativum or stratum basalis where they start to get cuboidal and then flatten out. So you know that this is a squamous mucosa on the right, but look, look at what is underneath. Now, strictly as a pattern recognition alone, I'm not going to talk science now, I'm talking pattern recognition. If you look at these epithelial clusters, like here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here, you would say, well, they do kind of look like the squamous stuff on top, but they're kind of growing haphazardly, and they're not so orderly. And in my opinion, it looks like they're infiltrating the underlying connective tissue. So what's the easy diagnosis for this? It's a squamous cell carcinoma. It's pure and simple. It's a squamous cell carcinoma derived from where most of them are derived from, from squamous mucosa. Now, all I could say, I have to ask you one question, okay? Let's take this little uh, button of tissue here. If you want to call it a pearl, you can. But I don't want to introduce the concept of a pearl yet. Let's say you take this group of cells and you look at it, or you ask your three-year-old uh, daughter to look at it, and then you say, do these cells here, honey, look like these cells here? Well, they'd probably say, yeah, except they're not growing in an orderly fashion. Remember, autonomous, they're out of control for growth limitations. That's the definition of cancer. Okay. Now, now I'm going to tell you something else.
This is the same tumor. It's a squamous cell carcinoma. And do you see how in the middle of a lot of these nests, it almost looks like it wants to mature or make collagen? I'm sorry, keratin. That was a big boo-boo. But the uh, keratin uh, swirls are kind of caught up within the middle of these irregular nests. Well, those are called pearls, by the way. And uh, they're, they're still malignant. They're more differentiated than the cells that are giving rise to them. But the, the whole thing is regarded as malignant. And um, if you see this high a degree of differentiation, you would probably call it a well-differentiated tumor. In other words, it's looking a lot like the squamous mucosa from which it developed. So we now have a well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Just offhand, do you think a well-differentiated one is better to have than a poorly differentiated one? Absolutely. That's almost a knee-jerk reflex. That's why I see all these yeses are uh, popping up instantly. Now, what if I, we went again to this uh, tumor, and let's say you didn't see this pearl here on the left. Let's say that all you saw were these cells here, but you took a very, very good look at the little spaces between the cells, like here and like here. Now remember I asked you today if you could see exquisitely good. What if you looked at that little space and you saw just like you see in the uh, prickle cell layer or the, um, the uh, acanthotic cells, you saw tiny little tonofibrils or desmosomes like you see in squamous cells. Let's say that you saw a few tiny little hairs crossing that gap. Those are called intercellular bridges. And that also means it's pretty well differentiated, but not as differentiated as the pearl, so to speak. So if you saw pearls, you could call it well differentiated. If you didn't see pearls, but you saw these little tiny hairs, these intercellular bridges, and I think you could see them. I hope you can see them. I hope you don't have to use your imagination too much. Um, then you would not call that well, but you'd probably call it moderate. Now, let me ask you one last question. Let's say that you knew it was squamous because it had all the squamous markers when you did your immunostains, but there's no uh, bridges and there's no pearls, but you still know it's a squamous cell carcinoma. Then what do you call it? Well, medium, or poor? Okay, what would you rather have, one that's well or one that's poor? Okay, you got the general principle. That's good. I don't have to say it a hundred more times. Great. Here's a here's a tumor, and you know you have to believe me because I didn't show you the gross picture. Or, and uh, these are not squamous cells. These are glands. Okay, everybody recognizes these as glands. In fact, not only are they glands, but it looks a little bit like the nuclei are still towards the base or basement membrane. These cells still have some polarity, so to speak because the nucleus is arranged more at the base of the columnar cell and it looks like there's a little bit of an orderly thing here but let's say that these cells are not in the colon are not limited to the mucosa let's say this was from the submucosa or the muscularis these are invasive glands so it's not just what they look like but it's what they do and even though these glands may not look terribly malignant offhand, they are invading. Invasiveness is the number one adjective which separates malignancies from non-malignancies. By the way, that's a board question in pathology every single year. So this is an adenocarcinoma, tumor of glands. Now there are other features here that uh, make you think it's malignant like for example you see a lot of mitotic figures in there and some of these glands are not separated from other glands by connective tissue but they grow what they call back to back but we'll get into that later this is an adenocarcinoma just to show you the difference between an adenocarcinoma and a squamous cell carcinoma okay now here's an interesting one here too here's a carcinoma and you're probably guessing right now 
that probably this mushroom-like structure in the middle are look sort of like epithelial cells, but these little cells scattered to the side of it are probably inflammatory cells or lymphocytes or fibroblasts or blood vessels. Now, let me ask you this. You know that if I told you this was uh, about half of the cells in this field are the carcinoma cells, like all along here, and maybe the other half of the cells, like here and here, are uh, inflammatory cells reacting to the malignant cells. What if I told you that we did some special markers and we know that these are carcinoma, epithelial-derived cells? So now I have to ask you, is this a squamous carcinoma or is this an adenocarcinoma? Now what's your answer? Your answer, in all honesty, is... Um, I really don't know. I, half of you are saying adeno, half of you are saying squamous, but a few of you are saying the correct word, and that's undifferentiated. So in other words, it's epithelial malignancy. It doesn't really differentiate morphologically. Uh, you know it's epithelial cells, and you could call this an undifferentiated carcinoma. And by the way, do you think some pathologists might be tempted to call this rather than undifferentiated? Do you think they might be tempted to call this poorly differentiated squamous or poorly differentiated adeno? Yeah, I, I certainly would. So I let's say that I had five pathologist friends over. Like last night I had two. But let's say I had five. And I said, what is this? I just showed it to a, a party, you know, after a drink. And one of them is going to say uh, undifferentiated carcinoma. The other one's going to say undifferentiated squamous, the other is a poorly differentiated adeno, one might even say lymphoma, the other, and you know, the one that never ever wants to make up his mind, the one that has the fear of always being wrong, half the pathologists I know, their greatest fear is being wrong, they would probably say uh, malignancy, period. Well, that's probably the most safe answer. And let's see, now that we got those principles nailed down, let's talk about other types of tumors. We told you that, I, I kind of led you to believe that tumors are either uh, connective tissue or epithelial, you know, sarcomas or carcinomas. But sometimes in a mixed tumor, you have both uh, proliferation of both the glandular portion as well as the connective tissue portion. And remember, the connective tissue is not the reaction to the glandular tumor. It's actually part of it. So that's what they call tumors of mixed differentiation. If you remember the old uh, uh, mixed tumor or what they now call pleomorphic adenomas of the salivary gland, the most common benign tumors of salivary gland. If you cut through them, you'll see both epithelial or glandular features as well as connective tissue or sort of cartilage looking like features. So you can have uh, mixed differentiation. And, and, and also with malignancy too. You can have an adenocarcinoma of the endometrium because the endometrium is glands. Or you could have a sarcoma of the connective tissue cells of the endometrium in the stroma, called an endometrial stromal sarcoma. But you can also have a tumor of the uh, uterus or endometrium that's both has truly malignant glands, carcinoma, as well as truly malignant connective tissue or sarcoma. And let's go even one step further and talk about the concept now of a teratoma. A teratoma, if you remember from your embryology, there's basically three germ layers which are imprinted in your mind forever, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. A teratoma is a tumor from more than one germ layer. So if you were led to believe that Mesoderm gives rise to connective tissue tumors, and parts of either endoderm or ectoderm give rise to epithelial tumors. That's true, but it could be more than one germ layer. And uh, teratomas are more than one germ layer. And if you go back more than one germ layer, you're talking about now 
toady potential cells. And where are most of your toady potential cells? Well, they're in your gonads. So most teratomas, even though they can occur anywhere uh, in a man, the most likely place for a teratoma is a testicle. In a woman, the most likely place for a teratoma is in the ovary. And the, the, the funny thing, I shouldn't say the word funny, but in the man, most teratomas are malignant. And in the woman, most teratomas are benign. So of all of the teratomas you will come in contact with in your practice, probably 80 or 90% of them will be the regular old dermoid cyst of the ovary. It's the most common solid tumor of the ovary in young women. So it may be cystic, but it'll have both connective tissue as well as epithelial elements. You'll have hair, you'll have sebaceous glands, you'll have muscle. In some of the teratomas, you even have very weird things like pieces of brain tissue, pieces of thyroid, tooth, you know. It's the only x-ray I could think of. Uh, you take an x-ray of a uh, woman with a teratoma, it's going to look like, of the ovary, it might look like a dental x-ray. You might see a tooth in there somewhere. Now, uh, so remember, teratomas are tumors derived from more than one of the three germ layers. Now, let's talk about things that are not really true neoplasms. For example, we've already mentioned that certain polyps are not really true clonal proliferations, but they're just excesses of uh, mucosal tissue. Now, the word hamartoma describes tumors, or I guess you could say tumor because it's oma, but it's not really a true neoplasm tumor point of view. And it's usually just a disorganized mass of tissue where cell types are indigenous to the site of the lesion. And what does that mean? Well, if lung, for example, normally has a little bit of cartilage surrounding a bronchus, then sometimes if that cartilage, rather than growing like a nice little circle, if it grows like a little ball, for example, they, but it still looks like benign cartilage, they might call that a hamartoma. Another thing is the term choreostoma, and I guarantee you this is the only time in your life you'll ever hear the word choreostoma, because in clinical medicine, and even in pathology reports, uh, you'll hear the word ectopic tissue, or heterotopia. Hetero means it's normal tissue, but it's not where it's supposed to be. Now, when we get to the chapter on pancreas, you're going to see, for example, that even though the pancreas forms as one nice organ, it's very, very, very common in embryologic development to have little pieces of pancreas tissue, you know, uh, plastered around the edge of the bowel or the stomach or even the esophagus. So that's just called ectopic tissue. Now, consider the concept of endometriosis, too. Endometriosis is normal endometrial tissue, but it's not confined to the endometrial cavity. It might be on the broad ligament. It might be on the bladder. It might be on the rectum. It might be in the ovary. You know, there's even extremely weird cases once in a million years where it's above the diaphragm. You know, it's, I've even heard about it in the nose once. Uh, imagine that. So that could be t thought of as heterotopia as well, not metastatic pancreas or metastatic endometrial tissue. However, it might be mistaken for metastatic pancreas, but if it looks like normal pancreas, but it's just not within the pancreas, you call it ectopic pancreas. Same thing for endometriosis. A little bit about nomenclature. I'm going to give you some exceptions to the general principle. Remember, we said that uh, if a tumor is malignant, then you're probably either going to have the word carcinoma or sarcoma as part of the name? Well, that's not always true because all hepatomas are malignant and they don't have carcinoma or sarcoma as part of the name. All melanomas are malignant and they don't have carcinoma or sarcoma as part of the name. All seminomas are malignant and they don't have carcinoma or sarcoma as part of the name. All lymphomas 
are malignant. There is no such thing as a benign lymphoma. That's why whenever you hear the word hepatoma, it may be preceded by the adjective malignant or most times, if you do a Google word search, probably the phrase malignant melanoma is used more often than just the word melanoma. And sometimes seminoma is always just seminoma. You'll never hear somebody say malignant seminoma, but they're all malignant tumors, even though they have benign sounding names. Okay, and that's why HCC, or hepatocellular carcinoma, which is the common acronym used for malignant liver tumors, is now used much more often than just the word hepatoma. Okay, some examples. Here's a cystic tumor. It looks like there's something in there that looks hard like bone. You can see little hairs in there too. And also, probably the most common uh, components of teratomas, no matter where they are, are hair and sebaceous material. But this might be portion of a tooth, for example. Maybe if you look microscopically, you'll see a little bit of thyroid tissue. And we're not going to go yet into what makes a, a teratoma benign versus malignant. But as you might guess, the more the tissues look like the normal tissues or the maturity of the tissue within a uh, teratoma, the more likely it is to be benign. Okay, what if I told you that this was part of that teratoma? Well, you see glandular tissue, don't you? You see some other glandular tissue here, don't you? But you also see non-epithelial tissue. You see bone. Anybody can recognize this as a bone. There's a few osteoblasts lining this spicule of bone. Those white things in the middle are osteocytes living within the matrix of the bone. Here's even bone marrow. You could probably find some megakaryocytes and red and white cell and platelet precursors in here. So this is a tumor of more than one embryologic germ cell. And by the way, all of the tissue that we have just described looks like perfectly normal bone, perfectly normal bone marrow, perfectly normal glands, perfectly normal uh, other glands. So let me ask you a question. Is this teratoma benign or malignant? Absolutely, you all got it right. Um, good. Next slide is another example of something. Oh yeah, it's, it's a, this one is a dermoid cyst. This is uh, from the ovary. The dermoid cysts of the ovary, even though they're called dermoid cysts because they have dermoid or skin-like things like squamous epithelium and sebaceous glands and hair follicles and hair, even that's why they're called dermoid cysts, but they really are teratomas because they also have connective tissue elements, you know, like some smooth muscle perhaps along here. And if, if you look at some of this fibrous tissue within the dermoid cyst, it is not fibrous tissue like fibroblasts reacting to the epithelial growth. It's actually part of the uh, tumor itself. Okay, where are we, by the way? Oh my God, we did a whole hour. Uh, but I don't think we went too slow because if you don't get these solid principles down now, you'll, you know, you're going to go the rest of your life, you know, believing the same crazy things that a lot of doctors do and getting the wrong terminology. So I'm glad that we went slow. Uh, plus, there's no time limit. I said we would do this in three days. Maybe it'll take us five days. Who knows? I'm going to ask you a last question, though, before we take our break. Uh, did I go too slow? Be honest. Well, I'm seeing about, you know, 20 or 30 no's in a row. So thank you very much. Uh, I felt like I went just at the right speed, but we've only done 18 PowerPoints in the first hour. That's okay. We'll probably wind up doing 40 or so. So uh, let's take our break. Uh, all of the music today is selected by me. And by the way, the last one, which you're not going to hear now, is a, a beautiful country and western song. So let's hear from Mary J. Blige. Let's hear from the village people. And let's hear from Marvin Gaye during our 10 minute break.
Six three was crazy from the kickoff. We don't wanna boss you why. We didn't build nothing overnight, cause a love like this takes some time. We can score it off as a face. Said we can't see that. Now from top to bottom, they see that we get that. Yes, it's so true that. Yes, we've been through it. Yes, we got rich. Yes, see, baby, we've been too long, too long. And I can't be without you, baby.
during the break I love them all and uh, I still have a big batch of the music that you sent me uh, which we will all play ultimately uh, we're back uh, usually uh, when I come back I get one or two little ideas in my head before we start again and I'll tell you what those ideas were the first thing is I noticed uh, uh, of course that Dr. Kamat is here today and, you know, I don't know, sometimes he brings his microphone and sometimes he doesn't. So, if he has a microphone now, maybe we could uh, convince him to just say hello. Uh, I know he's afraid to bring his microphone because a couple of times it's made some background noise during the webinar. But he's unmuted, so if he has a microphone and he wants to plug it in or turn it on, uh, Dr. Girish Kamat, take a bow. You've been doing a great job, and we've already heard from him. He doesn't have a microphone. That's okay. Maybe we could uh, coax you into it next time. The other thought that I had during the break was uh, about Dr. Zaiden. Dr. Zaiden is usually here. Dr. Zaiden spent a lot of time with me learning a lot of these techniques, which I know you appreciate. So I just wanted to tell you that he's uh, almost all set up. Dr. Zaiden is a world-famous biochem and physio professor and Dr. Zaiden I believe is going to be doing these exact type of webinars uh, probably like on a Wednesday because if I do mine on Tuesday and Thursday he'll be doing it at least on a Wednesday so uh, I think that uh, if you are interested in the same good quality of biochem uh, then you will uh, be able to see him soon on a Wednesday at the same time I do mine on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Okay, last but not least, I noticed during the break there were a lot of chat going on. There is no way that I can get this webinar system to have everybody see what's on chat. I wish there was. There's a lot of uh, fun, friendly things like somebody told me what a certain a drink was. 
uh, during chat time and I wish we could all chat with each other during break because that would be fun however as you all know better than I do because you're younger than I am you can always get your Skype going multitasking with the webinar and you could find a few friends a few buddies back and forth you had all a big email list that I've given you of everybody and you could just do some private chatting if you don't want everybody to hear you like me you might say oh Dr. Manarsik really sucks today and I don't think I'd want to see something like that so those are the thoughts get uh, Skype uh, keep Dr. Zayden in mind and we're going to urge Dr. Kamat to bring a microphone uh, in five days. Okay, let's continue with neoplasms. We've done a lot of background stuff, and you've all said it wasn't too slow or too simple. Uh, this little thing here, we're going to be dissecting with an electron microscope all the various aspects of it, but let's keep one thing in mind. Now that we've uh, made some basic definitions of malignancy, uh, we're going to look upon the natural history of malignant tumors, okay? Um, the process by which a malignant tumor develops, and of course it has to develop from non-malignancy, obviously. It's called transformation. So when you talk about a malignant transformation, you're talking about a series of steps. Many steps involved many different processes, and they're basically mostly all genetic, uh, in which you have uh, changes called carcinogenesis, which we're going to go to in great detail, uh, into the so-called transformed cells. And the transformed cells are at probably the best word for them is malignant. Now, even though I can tell you, here we are today, 2012, I really truly believe there is no one single genetic change or process that absolutely defines malignancy. You have to remember it's a series of steps. However, the one word, the one single word that describes all malignancies and separates them from non-malignancies is the word invasion. And sometimes on a pathology report, they might use the word infiltration rather than invasion. So local invasion has to be present for all malignancies. And when I took the pathology boards, I thought that it was the most stupidest question in the world. They asked me, what's the one word that differentiates all malignant tumors? And of course, everybody knows invasion. I thought that was kind of stupid, easy question, but it's so important because that's the number one thing. And of course, malignant tumors most or all, let's say, have the capacity to undergo distant metastases also. In other words, it means the growth of those transformed cells in a region other than which they started. And that might be because of traveling throughout the lymphatic vessels or throughout the uh, vascular system, the veins, even the arteries, okay? So that's the natural history of malignant tumors, and that's kind of like what we're going to be talking about again. Uh, so you might have read recently that there were a couple of guys recently very, that won a Nobel Prize in medicine. One was Dr. John Gurdon, and the other one was Dr. Yamanaka. And uh, they probably are the single most knowledgeable people in the world right now on this concept of differentiation. Because remember, we've talked about differentiation several times, including today, and we talked about it like it was a linear process, like a cell that was more pluripotential, closing off certain parts of its genetic control panel to become less differentiated. We always talked about it as being a one-way direction. And that's what everybody thought. That's what I was taught in medical school. That's what I believed up until about two days ago. And then these guys come around, uh, Dr. Gurdon and Dr. Yamanaka, and they take differentiated cells and do a few little whoop de zoo tricks on them, and they become extremely undifferentiated again. So there is such a thing as reverse differentiation. Nevertheless, 
Differentiation is a concept we've been thinking about almost every day of our life. And if a tumor is well differentiated, that's like long. That's a big distance on the differentiation time arrow. It means it resembles the mature cells from which they originated. And that's called a well differentiated neoplasm. And it could be benign or malignant, couldn't it? We're not really talking benign or malignant yet. Now, if you have a tumor that does not look like the mature cells of which they originated, but perhaps very primitive cells, then that's a poorly differentiated neoplasm. And most poorly differentiated neoplasms are malignant as well. Um, if you see a tumor that doesn't look like anything at all. It doesn't look like carcinoma, it doesn't look like sarcoma, it doesn't look like thyroid, it doesn't look like, they're just malignant cells. You're gonna have no problem understanding it's malignant. That might be called an anaplastic tumor or an undifferentiated tumor. And of course, nowadays, uh, these kinds of tumors are almost non-existent because we have a a uh, method called immunoperoxidase, which can stain specific proteins or antigens or even genes within the tumor cells to tell us generally what its origin is. Now, the reason why differentiation is so important is because it is a predictor of its biologic behavior. So, benign tumors or low-grade malignancies, they probably look well differentiated. They look like the cells from which they came. The poorly differentiated tumors are usually more aggressive. In other words, worse prognosis. They spread faster than the well ones. And um, what I'm trying to say is going to be, I hope, typified in the next couple of pictures. See these guys here? Let's say you're walking down the streets in New York and you saw these guys, and they're all looking at you. Well, you'd probably not be too uh, happy, would you? These are bad guys. These are bad-looking guys. This is a street gang, okay? So here's the, here's the principle. If the cells look bad, they're going to behave bad. And looking bad means not at all looking like the cells from which they arose from. Now, let's say that you're walking down the street uh, of uh, Salt Lake City, and you see these guys here, and they're singing uh, uh, hallelujah, okay? Well, this is a Mormon tabernacle choir. They look pretty good. They look orderly. They look kind. So if they look good, they're probably not going to beat the crap out of you, okay? So a tumor that looks good, good, and I mean good, is going to behave good. So you predict the biological behavior of a tumor just from its microscopic appearance. Now, now, nowadays, we go much further than that. It doesn't almost matter anymore what the cells look like. It's whether certain genes are mutated or not. That might even be the prediction for the future. It's already starting, by the way. The future is already here, but this is still the prime principle in traditional non-molecular pathology. Now here, let's say that you went to histology lab last year, I hope you did, and you saw these cells here. And the nuclei kind of look like cigars, they're kind of uniform, and you already know as a knee-jerk reflex, this is normal smooth muscle. And let's say you look at a tumor, like one of these little tumors in the uterus here, and you take a look at these same cells. And oh my god, this looks like normal smooth muscle too. So the question is, if the cells in this tumor look identical to the normal cells from which they arose, the smooth muscle of the uterus, is this most likely to be benign or malignant? Well, everybody, that's a rhetorical question. Everybody knows it's a benign tumor. And that way, it's, we all know this is a leiomyoma. But let's say that the cells in this tumor did not look at all like these normal, spindly, smooth muscle cells from histology 101. Let's say they looked like uh, 
Mercedes-Benz symbols and dogs and you know every other cell was uh, in the stage of mitosis like in here there are no mitotic figures in here there I can't really find one good mitotic figure either but let's say there were 10 mitotic figures in this do you think that this would then be a benign smooth muscle tumor lyomyoma or would you call it a fill in the blanks What's a malignant lyomyoma called? I know it's a long word, but yeah, you're all typing it in now. Lyomyosarcoma, thank you. Okay, so that's the principle. Um, the appearance of tumors microscopically, which makes pathologists instantly know they're benign or malignant, or most likely benign or malignant, have a variety of names. And I'm going to tell you the most, two most common names right now. Because if you read a pathology report from one of your patients, uh, and it's a cancer, most likely there's a very good chance you're going to hear the word pleomorphism on the report and hyperchromasia. And there's going to be a few other words too. But let's talk about the two most important ones. Because when I diagnosed a million cancers in my days, and I had to describe the cells, these are the two most common words I used. Pleomorphism means the cells do not look uniform. Some are bigger than others. Some are not the right shape as others. They're all different sizes and shapes. That's what pleomorphism means. It means variability of uh, shape. Also, in general, if you remember, you know, hematoxylin goes to the nucleus and eosin goes to the cytoplasm, you know, as, as a general rule. Well, cancer cells have more hematoxylin than usual, usually going to the nucleus. That's why it's called hyperchromatic. They're not just blue, they're dark blue. Or sometimes they just talk about dark cells as hyperchromatic cells. Now, technically, if a cell takes up, a nucleus takes up less uh, hematoxylin than normal, you might call that hypochromatic, but that word is just not used because tumors, are, I can't think of a single tumor where the nucleus is hypochromatic. So these are the two common words. Pleomorphism, referring to abnormal uh, uh, sizes and shapes in the nucleus. Hyperchromasia means uh, because of what's going on in that nucleus is taking up more hematoxylin than usual. But here's a few other things too. As you know, a benign cell generally has a nucleus, generally has a cytoplasm. Now, think about it. If the nucleus is generally getting bigger, like in pleomorphism, do you think that the ratio between the nucleus and cytoplasm goes up as an individual cell? Yes, it does. They like talk about NC or nuclear cytoplasmic ratio and that's particularly true when they talk about cytology. It's very important because in cytology you're often looking at individual cells. And also if you remember from basic histology there's a generally sort of uniform distribution of chromatin in most nuclei even though some of them kind of go towards the periphery like a lymphocyte. But generally you look at it in most microscopes it's kind of uniform. But in malignant cells, it often clumps. And sometimes it clumps so much, you don't know whether it's a clump of a chromatin or an additional nucleolus. Now, also in some tumors, the nuclei are not only multiple. Let's say the, generally you're supposed to see about one nucleolus, sometimes two normally, maybe three. Uh, uh, but often in malignant cells, you'll see you know two, three, four. And some of that might be clumped chromatin. And some of it might be just additional nucleoli, you know, that little uh, glob of RNA. Um, mitotic figures. Now, this one is the most logical of all. If you see a tumor or a tissue in which you don't see any cells within, you know, prophase or anaphase or metaphase, you know that that tissue or tumor is probably not growing very fast. But let's say, for example, you see tissue or tumor in which rather than an average of maybe uh, zero to one mitosis per high power field, which is about normal, <clears throat> let's say you see three per high power field or five or 10, 
then you know that that tissue is growing faster. So not only do you know how the cells are going to behave, but you know how fast they're growing. And there are other genetic ways of measuring this speed of turnover as well. Another thing is the type of mitosis. Let's say that you know from basic third grade biology that when you have a mitosis, the chromosomes pull off in two directions. Let's see a mitosis that's pulling off in three or four directions. Those are called multipolar mitoses. And a nucleus or a cell that has a multipolar mitosis is almost certainly malignant. And whereas I probably may have said that there's not one single absolute feature of any one cell that makes it absolutely malignant, a multipolar mitosis comes pretty close. You know, if you were to ask pathologists, give me an example of benign tissue that has multipolar mitosis, they'd probably stumble for a while. Now, let's go back to the nucleoli. In certain cancers, like prostate cancer, for example, uh, prominent nucleoli within the tumor cells is one of the main points of differenti differentiation which tells you this cell is malignant. So if you were to look at a normal prostate, you might not see too many prominent nucleoli, but if you look at a prostate where every cell has a prominent nucleus, probably an adenocarcinoma. Same thing with a mitosis, especially with the sarcomas and especially with the smooth muscle sarcomas. The number of mitoses within a connective tissue tumor is very often the main criteria to separate the benign from the malignant. So everybody path out. That's why pathologists spend a half an hour counting mitoses in multiple fields and then adding them up because they know, for example, if they see more than, oh, say three or four or five mitoses in a smooth muscle tumor per 10 high power fields, let's say, it's probably going to be a leiomyosarcoma rather than just a regular old benign fibroid smooth muscle tumor leiomyoma. Here's a typical uh, thing. Now, once again, you're going to have to not use logic when you look at this. You're just going to have to use pattern recognition. Let's say that your uh, three-year-old daughter is sitting next to you right now, and you just showed her a picture of, oh, uh, a normal uh, lung, and she sees the little spaces. And then you show her this, and she goes, oh, daddy, look at all those icky cells. They're big, they're dark. Well, this is a knee-jerk reflex for significant pleomorphism. Some of these nuclei are so big, so much bigger than others. Look at that one is about 20 times bigger than that one. And they're darker too. So if this is the amount of normal hematoxylin that a normal benign cell takes up, you know, what about that cell? That's taking up 50 times more hematoxylin or that one. They're dark, okay? They call them dark cells. So if you were to show this picture to any pathologist in the world right now, even the ones that just flunk their boards, they would just say malignant is a knee-jerk reflex. They may not know where it's from. And this one happens to be called an anaplastic large cell carcinoma of the lung. But it doesn't matter. These are malignant cells. And these are the two most common ways to describe them, even though we just learned about eight or nine, pleomorphism and hyperchromasia. Now, in all honesty, uh, you know that there is this concept we talked about in one of the earlier uh, lectures called dysplasia. Dysplasia uh, has a lot of uh, definitions, but in pathology, the most common definition for dysplasia means a process by which normal or benign cells look like they're turning into malignant cells. So, for example, a high-grade dysplasia may look like downright cancer. A low-grade dysplasia might look like normal tissue, but some of the cells are just a little bit more pleomorphic and hyperchromatic. So there are stages to it. And sometimes they give numbers to the stages, and sometimes they give letters, and sometimes they name them after people. 
And, you know, and probably by the time I'm done with this course, somebody's going to figure out another way to describe dysplasia. So dysplasia, when you look at tissues, means it's probably in the process of malignant transformation as part of that multi-step process. Mild dysplasia might be early in the process. Severe dysplasia would be right about the time that they're just downright cancer. So the most common area to where the word dysplasia is used now is in the uterine cervix. And don't forget, some of the terms dysplasia used in medicine and pathology do not refer to a developing malignancy. You know, like uh, fibrous dysplasia of bone, or there's other dysplasia, dys, dyspla um, renal dysplasia. They're not really, they're, that, that dysplasia is used in a different sense. So they may talk about dysplasia within a colon polyp. They may most likely talk about dysplasia in the squamous lining of the uh, cervix, and that's where most of the dysplasias are. And sometimes you can say hi, sometimes they give you numbers, sometimes they give you acronyms, sometimes they name them after a city, you know, like Bethesda, for example. But it's all the same process. And no matter what that uh, terminology is when you practice medicine, it's still the same thing. The buzzwords change, but the process never does. Does dysplasia always develop into a malignancy? Well, that's the fear, and that's why dysplastic lesions are very carefully watched, or surgery may even be done if it looks like uh, the cancer is imminent. But in, there's a, a lot of uh, evidence in the literature that sometimes dysplasia is reversible. But let's say, can you afford to play that fatal probability game with your patients? I don't think so. Now, sometimes the real high-grade dysplasia is called carcinoma in situ. And in situ means the cells are carcinoma, but they haven't invaded yet. So uh, in the old days, we used to struggle, you know, for hours fighting with each other, whether something was a severe or high-grade dysplasia or whether it was downright carcinoma in situ. And now it doesn't matter because now most of the modern classifications regard high-grade dysplasias uh, is the same as carcinomas that haven't invaded yet, or non-invasive carcinomas. And I think, well, I don't want to go into my soapbox, but I think part of that explanation was uh, economic too. So let's say that you're looking at a cervix. And let's say that in the lower left here, that's a normal squamous cervical squamous lining of an ecto cervix, remember? And remember there's this uh, squamal columnar junction in the cervix? So here's where the columnar starts and here's where the squamous ends. But these squamous cells are stratified, of course. And they also mature because like all squamous mucosas, they're a little bit more columnar towards the bottom. But as they go towards the top, they flatten out. In fact, the reason why it's called squamous is because the flat cells are what you name the entire membrane after. Even though they're more columnar at the base, this whole stratified mucosa is still called squamous. Now let's say you look at something like this here. Well, you could see part of a cervical gland, and you know that this is squamous over it. But look, the cells are bigger and darker. And yeah, they do mature. They do flatten out a little bit. But they're bigger and darker. So the absolute correct diagnosis for this is squamous dysplasia of the cervix. Now, some of you may say mild, some of you may say medium, some of you may say severe, and that's generally the way they're classified. Uh, sometimes they're called high-grade squamous epithelial lesion, or HSIL, if you think it's severe or bad. Or if it's just mild, you may call it low-grade uh, squamous epithelial lesion, or LSIL, or you may call it atypia, or you may call it dysplasia, or you may call it by uh, another classification that's still commonly used called CIN for cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. And if it's mild, you may call it one. And if it looks like it's almost carcinoma in situ, you may call it three. So let me ask you a question. Let's say, just from your own basic pattern recognition, I showed you this squamous dysplasia and now 
this squamous displeasure. Which one is worse? The first one or the second one? Absolutely, you're all getting it right. Because in the second one, uh, there's not much maturation. The cells at the top almost look exactly like the cells at the base. Plus there's more mitoses. Plus it's bigger, plus it's darker. So all of the words that we use now. So the first one you might have called a two. This one you might call a three. And generally, uh, over the generations, there's more and more pressure put on pathologists to call something uh, a little bit more nasty than he might have called it 20 years ago. And part of that is the fear of malpractice. But uh, no matter what, you know that this one is worse than the other one. Now, if this one you think is really bad, so you want to call it a three, is severe dysplasia or CIN3 or HSIL, do you think that this would also deserve the term carcinoma in situ? Yeah, it is. Now, let's say, for example, that we all agree this is carcinoma in situ or CIN3 or high-grade dysplasia or whatever. But let's say that you saw a little part of this carcinoma in situ was starting to go into that little vessel down there or pierce through the thing. Would you still call it in situ? Absolutely not, you call it invasive. So even though this all looks like in situ, if you found just one little area where it breaks that basement membrane, you're in a whole different category because now you have a potentially metastasizable lesion. Carcinoma in situ does not metastasize because it doesn't invade. In fact, uh, you might find some reports where you hear of carcinoma in situ that's also in the lymph nodes. Well, what does that mean? It means it really wasn't in situ. There was probably some little area that they just didn't see. That's all. And that's common. Okay. Let's talk about tumor growth rate. We said, according to the clonal uh, theory of neoplasms, which is a correct theory, we have a cell, and then it multiplies, and it multiplies again, blah, blah, blah. But you might say, well, how many uh, multiplications or doublings or divisions? This is one case in which the word division means exactly the same as multiplication. Uh, how many, in all actuality, because we know some of those cells are dying, some of those cells are differentiating, but how many doublings until you get a billion cells? See, 10 to the 9th, that's a billion. And a billion tumor cells is about a gram. You could do the math. When that theoretical one clonal malignant cell develops, how long will it be before the tumor is only one gram or a billion cells? Well, that's 30 doublings if you do the math. You know, because if you go two, four, six, eight, when you get to 30 doublings, it's a billion cells. Well, generally the theory is it's usually not too quick. It's usually years, but I'll tell you, in some cases we've seen that it's months. So we'll say months to years. Now, you know that a one gram tumor, no matter what, is not going to kill anybody. But let's get another rule of thumb. How much tumor do you need in your body to what would be what we most people would say was a lethal burden? It means because of anatomic and physiologic uh, problems, it, it, you're going to die, okay? Well, that's only about 10 more doublings. So to go from one gram to one kilogram, it's usually about 10 more doublings. Is that they call the lethal burden? So if your patient has about a kilogram of tumor, maybe some of that is primary, maybe some of that is metastatic, but you do the autopsy, you cut out all the tumors, you put on the scale, it's a kilogram. Most likely, uh, patients are going to die soon when they have about a kilogram. Remember, that's over two pounds of tumor. That's a general rule, a lot of exceptions, but we're talking mathematics now. These are the physicists doing the pathology for us. But remember, only the cells can divide which are in the replicative pool. So let's say you have a glob of tumor cells. Some of those can't divide because some of them are differentiated already. Some of them are dead. Some of them are dying. But in, even in the worst tumors, maybe only 20% of the cells are in this replicative pool. 
So let me ask you this. If you were developing a chemotherapy, which cells would you be going after? The cells in the replicative pool or the ones that are differentiated, necrotic, or death? Oh, of course, those are the ones that the chemo is going after, the replicative cells. Those are the ones that are growing. We want to stop them from growing. If they're already grown and they can't multiply anymore, if 100% of your cells are in the non-replicative pool and they will stay 100%, even if it's a cancer, and the patient is feeling good, they'll probably feel good until they die of old age. You know, that's the general rule. But don't forget, some of the cells are undergoing apoptosis. Some of them are maturing. We already talked about the indications for therapy. Let's look at the diagram here. I think this might be from Robbins. So, you know, there's your one gram cell, you know, a square centimeter. It's also about the same uh, uh, size at what would be easily picked up by CT, for example. But now you got your one gram thing after 30 doublings. It's one gram or a cubic centimeter, let's say, because it's about the same density as water. And then uh, technically that could metastasize. Now, could a small group of cells less than one gram metastasize? Yeah, it could. Melanomas do it all the time. But most tumors, as a general rule, if they're malignant and you get them at one centimeter, chances are they have not metastasized maybe microscopically into regional lymph nodes. And now we've got 10 more doublings. So if it was, let's say, um, months to years to go from one tumor cell to one gram of cells, it might be more months to years before you go from here to here. And of course, the aim of chemotherapy is to extend that time, isn't it? You know generally you're not going to kill all the replicative cells, but if you could extend significantly uh, that time, maybe even push it to the patient's normal expected lifespan, that is the goal of chemotherapy. You know, my wife had cancer, and we talked about this extensively with the oncologist, and we would, we would go to her chemo clinics, and uh, if you think a chemotherapy clinic is something, the most depressing thing in the world, let me tell you, it's the happiest thing in the world, because the patients have hope and they know that their doubling times or the time it goes from one gram to one kilogram, that's going to be significantly lengthens with the correct chemotherapy. So the oncologist told me that like AIDS, possibly within our lifetime, but maybe a little bit longer, cancer could be made into a chronic manageable disease. Okay, and there's your ball of tumor cells, and some of them are red, which means they could metastasize. Some of them are light blue, which means they could invade. Some of them are non-antigenic, which means they're not going to be recognized. And here, let's even show you a better example. Remember when we told you that cells, any cell in your body, can do only three things? It could multiply, it could differentiate, or it could die? Well, that's the same thing true with tumor cells. The cells that can multiply is the so-called uh, pool of proliferation. This is your proliferative pool. They're transformed already into cancer cells. They can multiply. Now, if they differentiate into something that's more specific, they're probably not going to multiply anymore. If they undergo apoptosis through either normal reasons or perhaps chemotherapy or more likely immune system attacking of them because they are not recognized as MHC good guys then they're going to die but even if your uh, replicative pool is only 20% of your tumor cells you can still have a fastly growing tumor and just, I don't think I want to say anything more about this so what are the features of malignant tumors? Well, we said the number one thing was invasion. However, we also called something carcinoma that hasn't invaded yet. That was CIS, carcinoma in situ. The reason why they don't invade is uh, malignant tumors probably, if they were encapsulated early in the stage, 
by fibrous tissue reaction around them. They may invade through the capsule. But in most of the epithelial malignancies, you know, the adenocarcinomas, the squamous carcinomas, the minute they pierce that basement membrane, it's invasive. They can metastasize, and metastasis is an unequivocal sign of malignancy. Benign tumors do not metastasize. You may find a wise-ass pathologist somewhere that'll say, "Oh, what about these uh, uh, vas? What about these uh, lyomyomas uh, in the vascular? They're they're benign. They or what about endometriosis? They're benign tissue, but they metastasize. Well, that's not metastasis. That's heterotopia. Remember." Malignant tumors can seed body cavities. They can spread through lymphatics. They can spread through hematogenous, through blood vessels. And let me tell you an extremely important principle right now, and I hope you know it already. If I told you that if you wanted to divide the two main kinds of malignancies, sarcomas and carcinomas, let me ask you this. Which tumor is more likely to go through the blood vessels before it even gets to the lymphatics, the sarcomas or the carcinomas. Yeah, you're right. That's why the clinical presentation of most sarcomas is cough and lung problems. Okay, you go, you have a cold, it doesn't get better. You go to your doctor, he sees a bunch of nodules in your lung. Okay, now some of them can go through lymphatics too. Now, what about theoretically a carcinoma now? Is a carcinoma most likely to go through a lymphatic before it goes through the uh, blood vessels? Absolutely. That's a general rule which I have never forgotten and will always be correct. I learned that when I was even younger than you are. Okay, what about this tumor here? Let's say this was from a breast, or it doesn't even matter. But let's say you're looking at the tumor. Now, can I ask you a question? Is the margin of this tumor pretty sharp? And in addition, do you see this little white rim around the tumor? It's, maybe you think it's fibrous tissue. It probably is. So it has, it's encapsulated, let's say. Now, is an encapsulated tumor more likely benign or malignant? Well, you know the answer. And let's take a look at that capsule even microscopically now. This is a, we already said because it looks like it's encapsulated grossly, it's probably benign. And so it doesn't matter what these little uh, structures look like here, but you can see that uh, this tumor kind of pushes against the fibrous tissue of the surrounding breast, and that's what they uh, call a capsule because there's this extra little layer. Sometimes it's a vague layer of fibrous tissue, but most capsules are just fibrous tissues. Sometimes they're lined by epithelium, but most of the time they're just fibrous capsules around tumors. This happens to be the most common benign tumor of the breast of young women. So what is that? That's a fibroadenoma. But we'll talk about that in more detail. Now let's take a look at this breast tumor. In all honesty, when you take a close look at the margin of this breast tumor, do you really see a sharp line of demarcation between the tumor and the fat? Or does it look like it's sending these little crab-like projections. So let me ask you this, even if you haven't uh, gone through the microscope yet and you cut open this tumor or the radiologist sees it as being uh, having these little crab-like margins. By the way, uh, in astrology, uh, what is the crab sign called? The crab in astrology. What's the name of it in astrology? Yeah, it's cancer, isn't it? So now you know how cancer got its name. It got its name because it's invasive and it sends these little crab-like projections of the surrounding tissue. So let's say that you want to not get sued and you don't want to call this cancer uh, by looking at it under the microscope too because then you could charge for a microscopic exam, not just a gross exam. And here it is. And you can see some cells here and some cells here and some cells here. But look at the cells are streaming off. And here's some fibrous tissue here, and here's some fibrous tissue here. So it's also poorly defined or unencapsulated microscopically as well, isn't it? Now let me ask you this. 
Somebody said lobular cancer, but let's not deal with that yet. It very well could be, but it is absolutely poorly defined from the surrounding breast. Now, probably on the east coast here, the third of this picture, there's probably no tumor cells at all. And probably there's fewer tumor cells here in the intermountain west. But the whole south and streaming up into the Great Lakes to Canada, these are all tumor cells, isn't it? Um, last question. Let's say that you're all convinced that this fibrous tissue here is different from these glandular or epithelial tumor cells. Here's the question. Is this fibrous tissue part of the cancer? Is it malignant fibrous tissue? Or is it just a reaction to the carcinoma? Yeah, it's a reaction. It's called the scarus reaction in breast. Sometimes it's generally referred to as desmoplastic because desmo means connective tissue. And it means that if you cut through this tumor, when you cut through a tumor, a malignant tumor in a breast, you could have your eyes closed and you could diagnose malignancy because you can hear it. It's gritty. So sometimes you could, that's an example of diagnosing a malignancy by being blind. You hear the grittiness as you cut through it. Your knife goes, <laughs> okay. So that's microscopic. And here's another microscopic picture. And you could see a lot of what they call glands growing in every which way and you can see there's a lot of fibrous tissue in reaction to it so already you already know that some cancers evoke a lot of uh, fibroblastic reaction to it perhaps it's an immune attempt to localize or close off the tumor uh, if that's true then you would think maybe the tumors that have more fibrous tissue would be better than the tumors with less fibrous tissue I don't know maybe that's true but the one thing that is true is that the more lymphocytes that you see surrounding uh, malignancy everything else being equal is probably better than having no lymphocytes because that means there's some type of immune reaction going on against the tumor cells so the breast carcinomas which have abundant lymphocytes as part of the tumor, are probably going to do better than ones like this, which you could see have practically no lymphocytes. Oh, there's probably a few here and a few here. But for the most part, there's no lymphocytes reacting to this tumor, only fibrous tissue. Okay. Here's another tumor. It's in a liver. Um, this is metastatic disease. The liver and lung are without a doubt the two most likely places for any cancer to metastasize to. And you know if you have a cancer of a uh, portal vein organ like the bowel or the pancreas or the duodenum, it's most likely to go to the liver like it's a lymph node because that's a portal circulation. But that's a, that, that doesn't matter. Any cancer go to the liver and lung ultimately. So let me ask you this now. Let's say you were a, a pathologist, but you were blind, you know, which is kind of a little bit of a disability. But let's say that you uh, felt now the surface of this liver, and you see a big nodule here, and then there's something that feels normal here, and then here's a medium nodule, and here's a small nodule, and here's what feels like normal, and all of this stuff feels like normal. Could you diagnose with great, great, great probability metastatic disease to the liver, even if you were blind? Of course. Now let me ask you this. Let's say that rather than having a big nodule here and a normal liver here and a medium nodule here, let's say it was diffusely small nodules. There were no areas that had normal, but it was all diffusely small nodules. Would it be metastatic disease then or would it be most likely cirrhosis? Yep, you got it. You got it. Here are tumor cells and you might think, well, there's a lot of lymphocytes here, and there's a lot, looks like a germinal center here. Look at here's a lot of lymphoid tissue. Maybe these glands are inside of a lymph node. So this is a classical metastatic adenocarcinoma to a lymph node. Now, but what percentage of this lymph node is replaced by tumor? 10%, uh, 50%, 90%. You're all saying 90%. In fact, 
there's such few lymphoid tissue left in this lymph node, you might even doubt whether it even is a lymph node. You'd think maybe it's just a tumor nodule in the fat, and there's a few lymphocytes trying to fight it. But most likely that's a positive lymph node. I can't prove it, but most likely it is. Let's talk about the significance of metastasis to lymph nodes, and then we'll call it a day. The general rule is, you know, carcinomas go to lymph nodes. So if you do a surgery and you look at the lymph nodes and they're all negative, and you really do a good job, you cut them and you examine them for hours, that patient's going to live. Okay, that has a high 80, 90, 99%. That's the general rule. And of course, in the old days, if the lymph nodes were negative, uh, they told the patients, you know, you're cured. It's a kind of a, you know, a, a bold thing to say. And of course, in the classical Halstead radical mastectomy, you would yank out all the lymph nodes too. And that has its problems, you know, lymphedema. And somebody says, well, what if we inject a little bit of radioactive dye, or I shouldn't say dye because dye does not mean radioactive. Sometimes there are blue dyes, what they call the uh, supravital blue dyes, or sometimes there's radioactive isotopes that go to lymph nodes. And let's say that we inject a little bit of radioactive dye where the tumor is, and then we look with a scanner to see the first lymph node that picks up that dye. That's called the sentinel node, by the way. Because it's the sentinel. It's the guardian. It's the first one to pick up a metastasis. If that sentinel node is negative, then we don't have to cut out all of these lymph nodes. And we can still tell the patient they're going to live. And also the general principle was, if the nodes were negative, you don't have to do chemotherapy because the patient's probably cured. But you know that's not really true. Uh, that there's a lot of adjuvant or... Uh, additional or helping chemotherapy done now even for lymph nodes and breasts and other places that are negative. And in certain organs like a stomach for example if you have even one positive lymph node most likely that patient's not going to make it. In other organs you may have a couple positive lymph nodes and they'll still make it so to speak. So these are the significance of lymph nodes metastasis. And what I want to say is, if you think pathologists spend half of their day uh, in the afternoon going through the organs that were taken out and trying to find lymph nodes, and then chopping them up to look at the, every single lymph node, maybe even doing a special stain to see if any epithelial cells are in that lymph node, looking very closely at the subcapsular sinus, to see if there's any group of cells in an otherwise normal looking lymph node. If you think that that's pretty tedious and boring, let me tell you, it is. But can I tell you, if you work for a long time on that breast or colon or uh, kidney specimen or whatever, lung, and you truly say the lymph nodes are negative because I worked all day on it, then guess what? You save that patient's life and you're going to tell that information to the surgeon, and the surgeon's going to walk into the room and tell the family, and they're all going to start crying and bowing down to him because they think he's God. And the reason why they think he's God is because they think he, found, he looked through the lymph nodes himself. He didn't tell them there was a poor slob pathologist in a stinky formalin lab, you know, looking at it for six hours to make that, to do that hard work and make that statement. Okay, you know, we'll call it a day. How many, we only did 39 PowerPoints. Maybe we'll finish uh, next uh, session or maybe we'll go into a third session, but we're going to have at least one full session of lab because after you have all of this information about cancers, we're going to be looking at them in the lab and seeing a lot of the consistent features. And I guess we're kind of done for the day. It's what? It's already 11.01. I had so much fun today. Um, the song that we're going to play as our closing song is a country and western song. I usually don't do country and westerns for a closing song. But this is a very, very beautiful country and western song. And uh, it means we're over for the day. I had a great time. Uh, 
We'll see you in five days minus two hours. We'll finish up with cancers and somewhere along the line have a real big lab. So, folks, um, see you in five days.
Rock on, you buzzards.